So what else we got? That's it. All right. Well, we're very glad that we can uh, worship together. And, uh, and uh, let's begin with singing as the worship team leads us. Stand, please. We're going to sing No Greater Love, and there's a, a phrase in there that says, No greater love than the love that found me. And I wonder if you've been found by that love. The Bible says there is no place that we can go to get so far away that God cannot find us. He is the God who sees, and He knows what you're going through or where you've been, and that great love he expressed to us in Jesus is for you. He wants you. Let yourself be found by that love. no greater love than I have ever found no one else I know would lay his own life down for someone like me in my vanity and pride with a selfless love you restored my life No greater 
so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire And in darkness close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Quick announcement before we get on with the with the service. If anybody hasn't signed the card for Sarah or the pastor, they're still out there. Pastor's card's pretty full, but there's room on the back. So if you haven't had the chance, please, and make sure you tell them how much you appreciate them. Please join me in the call to worship. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of the pit.
Please be seated. Thank you, ladies, and uh, we'll miss you well. Jane's getting rehab for her shoulders. <sighs> Had a visit yesterday from a woman who was just full of gratitude. Uh, so she received some help from the church in the past. I guess some financial help, but you know, you don't always get a card like this. Dear neighbor, I can't thank you enough, and it's addressed to the entire church. I cannot thank you enough for helping me in some really hard times. Your help and generosity is very much appreciated. May God bless you all. So, you're, even without a card like that, the scripture is still true that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And, uh, but it's always good to get those thank yous, and I want you to know that your generosity is appreciated. Um, we prayed for a baby named Elias in Holland, who's doing very well after a fourth surgery that was essential. Uh, Barbara, that her surgery went well. Been some good answers to prayers. Uh, but many more need our help, and let's join in prayer. Lord, we thank you that your goodness keeps running after us. We thank you for your Tenacious love. Thank you that even when it's hard for us to see it, you are at work. And then those answered prayers come bounding out. Lord, we're glad that we can put our trust in you. Glad that we can bring to you the tough stuff and glad to know that having placed it in your hands, you will work it for good. Lord, so we uh, continue to pray 
for those needing your healing touch who are going through difficult times and even for those who are nearing the end of this life and preparing to be with you. Lord, uh, we thank you for Karen Santafonte and pray you continue that healing, that you be with Norma and, uh, and with Pete. Lord, we lift to you Danielle Zerola Morois. We're praying for a young mom in Connecticut. Had some discouraging news this, this, uh, this week with a tumor on the liver that grew in spite of some treatments. Lord, the doctor she calls Dr. Awesome is, uh, still has some choices and some uh, options. And we just pray, Lord, that you would lead them to the right solution and that you would bless it to be effective so that her uh, husband and young boy would, uh, would enjoy her and have her restored to health. Lord, our Deacon Emeritus Linda at Southwood, please hold her close. The family of Ruth Ikasolo, Lord, she, her mom, her husband, each need your care. Please hold them close. And Mim's cousin's wife, Barbara, some dangerous falls and low oxygen to brain is involved. Surgery's coming. Help, Lord, be involved. Work it for good. Let your light be seen in each one. We lift you Denny Walker, Lord. He's the husband of an Army Sergeant Major, friend to the Beninados. Sudden surgery this week. Please work healing in his life. Jennifer, because of a thumb injury on medical leave, hold her and her family close. And Laura Lynetta's dad, Preston Ripley, is at Beth Israel in Boston, Lord, with serious, serious heart issues. Please be there. We are glad to hear from our friend and former member, Bon Koo, Lord, but his son has a tumor in his brain. So would you, Lord, please work healing but also with Bond, we pray that in his son's life, this would become an opportunity to grow in faith and to have a peaceful mind and not worry. Pray for Jack Neal, brother-in-law to Bob Dylan. Some serious esophageal and lung cancer. He's in South Shore Hospital. Please heal, Lord. Lord, we thank you for upholding Sarah and Bruno through Sarah's pregnancy and as the day draws near for Amelia to see the light, we pray that you would uh, just have your hand upon all that process and bring her safely into, uh, into this life for her. And Lord, uh, hold Sarah and Bruno uh, in your care throughout the process. We lift you Winnie, Lord. Wendy's mom has been hospitalized again. Hold her very, very close. And for Debbie Duke, needing uh, to make progress with physical therapy. Be there, Lord. And there have been sorrows, Lord. We, uh, through the difficulty of the shooting in Maine and all that went through that, so many are shocked. Many have lost someone they love. But it also changes how one feels about one's town. And Lord, Remind us that we have always been response, uh, dependent upon your care. And would you put your comfort on those who grieve there, but also upon uh, of the friends and family of Dom, including his wife, Carol. Uh, the friends and family of Patricia Harlfinger, Lord. Her husband, Dick, spoke here as a stewardship speaker one year. And Along with family, her friend Patricia Leslie is grieving. Please hold them close. Heavenly Father, it seems like there are many hot spots politically and disasters around our world right now. But you are the one, you hold the whole world in your hand and you are capable. So we ask that you would minister mercy comfort and hope in each situation and that the, pe the world would know the peace that comes from the Prince of Peace. 
So whether it be Israel and Palestine, Ukraine, Armenia, all these others, Lord, hold them close. Be with those who are traveling, Lord, the Delanos, with Steve Much, Lord, all who travel, hold them close. We depend on you, but we also pledge ourselves to you, Lord, wanting to be effective witnesses for the cause of Christ in our communities, in our places of work, in our families. Every place you bring us, Lord, help us to remember that we represent you. But Lord, also, would you please shine through us? We are helpless without you. We thank you that you call us your children and that Jesus, you've called us your beloved, your friends. Together we pray as you taught, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm, I'm going to invite David Gray to make his way forward here. And as he does, just remind you that we're coming toward our, our uh, stewardship season, time to reflect on the goodness of God to us that keeps running after us, but also to, uh, to pray about, Lord, what would you have me give toward the church or as we try to prayerfully plan the work that God has for us? What is there that's available? And so we each put our bits. Sort of like, Jim, notice how each bell member was each doing their part, kind of concentrating. Um, and they're all working hard, but together it forms something. And so we each do our part so that together we might have our church life be a sweet song in God's ear. But I asked David if he would reflect on what it means to be a steward. David? You all have three hours to wait? <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> and I'll be short. Um, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, and the same God who works all, thing, all things in all persons. America was founded by men and women who had a high regard for the creator of this nation and all its natural resources and beauty. Our Declaration of Independence makes it clear that, quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, all people, are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are le life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, being created equal in God's eyes refers to our spiritual nature, not our physical form. We each have been given different physical and mental gifts to use responsibly for God. Difficulties and opportunities create ways to use the many gifts God has given to each of us, and it creates a different person for each one of us to serve God. The word steward is rooted in the Greek word for managing a household, a whole household. For Christians, it refers to the responsibility we have in maintaining and using gifts that God has given to us, our talents, our ever-changing circumstances, and our finances. We can use some of our talents in practical ways, like helping with programs sponsored by the church, greeting at the worship service or other programs, bringing clothing or food items, pledging support for missions or other church outreach. <coughs> the tithe that is considered in the Bible is 10% of the Lord's way, which is the Lord's way of asking us to show our love for him. Giving God a percentage of our earnings shows that we put our love for him before our need for money. In a nutshell, I have three quotable quotes, as they would say, or memorable quotes, one sentence or so apiece, this three. And each of these have been said by someone I know or by myself. It, it, it wasn't until God got into my wallet that I experienced the blessings of, of giving to him. 
Second one, giving the first 10% off the top instead of what's left over at the end of the month means I have to trust the Lord. And it always somehow works out well for me. And finally, if I can't live on 90% of what I have, I need to reconsider what's going on. God is often a God of good surprises. I have one illustration. For several weeks, a well-dressed woman had attended the worship service. Her whole outfit was impeccable. And, come, and she, comes, she came through the line saying, good morning to the pastor. Then one Sunday, she looked around at the folks that were in line too, and she, could, and she said so others could hear, I put a hundred dollar bill in the offering this morning. To which the pastor kindly replied, I'm sure God is grateful if that's the best you can do. <laughs> she went off and returned the next Sunday and coming through the line proudly announced, I doubled my offering this morning, pastor. And he kindly replied gently, I'm sure that the Lord is happy with your offering, if it's the best you can do. She didn't show up the next Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Nor the second Sunday after. But the third Sunday she did show up and waited until the line was gone and nobody else but she and the pastor were there. And she quietly said to him, thank you for teaching me a lesson I needed to learn. She felt convicted by not returning only a small portion of her, single, of her significant resources to God through the church. And he kindly and gently replied, I'm sure God is grateful for your response if it's the best you can do. <laughs> well, he did wait until after the fellowship hour was over and the financial secretary and the treasurer came to him. Hey, pastor, do you know what we got in the offering today? And he very gently replied, no, are you going to tell me? <laughs> no strings attached for the church and God's work a check for $20,000. All of us have resources beyond what we use, and not the leftover is what we need to give to God, if it's the best we can do. Amen. Thank you, Dave. In the weeks ahead, we'll have a, another lay witness speaking next week. Uh, I'll share with you some of what the Bible teaches us about how God loves us through our giving. And then also on the 19th of November, we'll have the privilege of having Benjamin Klimczak, a layman from Connecticut, coming and sharing with us. <laughs> I've walked off with people's stuff before. <laughs> <laughs> but also, you, you will receive or have received a letter that uh, gives information about our stewardship. and. Uh, there will be information about a, a pledge card, a faith promise. It's really the same thing. It is not a legal binding document. You're absolutely free to give more than what you say. But, or, you know, if something happens, it happens. It's, it's us each trying to do our best will about, okay, God, we're in this together as a church. We want to serve you. Help us understand what we should plan. Plans change, but without a plan to start, you know, if you're walking somewhere, you got to take a first step in the right direction. So that helps us do that. So that's coming forward. And this week, as always, we think about our gifts to God. It's a regular act of worship, trusting him. It's, you know, it's a good thing to do it week by week and, you know, that we are continually abiding in God and in that relationship with him. So uh, whether you've uh, placed your offering in the basket in the back or mailed it in or used the QR code or the donate tab on the uh, website. 
we, we make our offerings. We respond to God's goodness. And let's dedicate all those gifts. And just before we do that, um, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, the, uh, the band of brothers that gathered at a, at a home of a recently passed away older member of their church yesterday, and we did some cleanup. And it was, we had a great fun working together, and the family was appreciative, and uh, it was good to see, you know, that's an offering too. Let's pray. God, all our gifts we offer to you. We thank you that you are so very worthy of our worship. Would you accept these gifts, please? Would you bless them to your purposes? And would you help us to be wise and faithful in how we use the resources you bring our way? As a church, receiving these offerings and such, but also each of us in our daily lives, that we might honor you with our substance. In Jesus' name. Please stand. Let's sing together. Our scripture reading is from Genesis 16, verses 1 through 6. This is the continuation of Abraham's journey. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abraham had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave, you. I gave my slave girl to you to embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. This is the word of the Lord.
you very much. Just, just a, a side, you know, many of you know that when we first meet Abraham and his wife Sarah, they're actually known as Abram and Sarai, and later on the, the names get changed to what we're used to. I'm not going to keep, I'm not going to try to be exactly correct with where we are in the story with which name I call them. We're just going to go with Abraham and Sarah. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> But it can happen in just about every sphere where people are well known. Some of them, you know, we call stars, uh, actors, actresses, athletes, musicians, stars. And we admire them from afar. And we put big poster pictures on our walls when we're young. But, you know, sometimes we idolize political and religious leaders. Their public images inspire us. They encourage us to do great things. But then what happens when we meet and get to know our heroes? Some, and the late golfer Arnold Palmer comes to mind, they work very hard to be gracious and patient when meeting admirers. Palmer taught many young golfers not to just scribble some autograph. He said, you want to give them something they can show others and be proud of. He used to say, don't sign your autograph, draw it. That's why he had that little uh, umbrella. Fun fact. But sometimes we can be very disappointed. That we, the ones we admired, we find that personal lives are riddled with mistakes, with harmful choices and habits. And some personalities come across as flat out rude. Sometimes we cut them slack for the pressure they're under, but at other times, fame at an early age seems to have arrested their maturity and their development as human beings. Today marks the fourth consecutive week where we look at the life of Father Abraham, honored by Christians, Jews, and Muslims. He is a pioneer of faith, but you already know, he's not the ideal role model in all areas of life. The Bible does not teach us to worship people, but rather the God who wants us each to draw near to him from where he, we are to where he can take us. Both of our readings today involve they describe mistakes involving relationship triangles that include Abraham and his wife, Sarah. In the passage Skip read for us, Sarah's handmaid, Hagar, is the other point in the triangle. And we'll later meet Abimelech, a nearby king, in our second reading. But Abraham's star is fallen in both situations. He made some big mistakes. So in Abraham, we see not so much a saint's sanctity, but God's graciousness. You know, more than a two-dimensional, carefully imaged, uh, of managed image of a person, 
The Bible time and time again faithfully describes how God works with mistake-ridden people, rescues them from troubles of their own making, and leads to, toward better outcomes in the future. I don't know about you, but that's exactly the kind of help I need. Human relationships are the most complex issues in our lives. Give me rocket science or brain surgery anytime. It's a challenge to deal with the failures and the foibles of other people. I can't understand why they think it's a challenge to deal with mine. <laughs> But we can learn to contribute fewer problems to, into those relationships ourselves. My goal is to help you see today that we get into trouble in our relationships when our vision of God is too small. While in college, I was friends with some guys in the Pi Kappa Alpha fraternity, though I never pledged. Um, but it was decidedly not a party frat. One spring, however, all the fraternities decided to hold some sort of charity fundraiser, kind of like a soapbox derby, but it was supposed to be the most unusual-looking vehicle to roll down a hill. Was, there was a paved road on a strong slant that had fraternity houses on either side of it. Somehow, I agreed to be the driver for the Pi Kappa Alpha car. I didn't have to build it. In fact, they wouldn't show it to me ahead of time. Not a good sign. <laughs> I'm not sure, actually, that it existed until the morning of the race. Race time found me seated uncomfortably behind a badly modified child's tricycle. We all lined up, and some of the other oddball entries were obviously designed to win. We could each receive a push to start, and that was a good thing, because when the pushing stopped, so did my vehicle. In spite of gravity, I remember inching my way down the hill. And I may have gotten off and pushed it the rest of the way until it, once it was obvious that the pica entry was destined to come in last. All this is to say that just because you're in a race don't make you fast. And being on the journey with God doesn't by itself make you a great sojourner. As you'll see in the messed up relationships in these passages, pilgrimage, being on the journey with Jesus, is no cure-all for stupidity. The good news is, however, even when our bad choices would threaten to torpedo our relationships, God won't let us sink beyond repair. And I'm grateful. First of all, let's consider Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, Hagar, her Egyptian maidservant. And that time and place, being childless, was reason for shame. But Abraham had heard from God that he would be the father of a great nation. Sarah felt that she was letting her husband down. She felt that God had already been given enough time to get her pregnant. But it hadn't happened. Sarah thought God needed help. Thoughtful of her, don't you think? That's a small vision of God. Soon she settled on what she saw as a solution. It was legal in that place and time for a woman's servant to become a surrogate wife for the woman's husband. I'm not saying it was a good idea, only that it was legal. Did you note that Sarah tells Abraham to have relations with Hagar, and then when he does, she says to him, what have you done? <laughs> I'm tempted to pity Abraham, but really, what was he thinking? This was not going to work out well from the moment it started. Abraham made it worse, however, by not being an arbiter between two warring parties. Hagar was powerless and vulnerable. Abraham permitted Sarah to treat her as less than human. She says to the servant, go get out and I don't care what happens to you. 
So here's how that story continued, beyond what Skip read. The angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of the water in the, in the wilderness, and he said, Hagar, where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress. I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted. He told her to name her son Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has given heed to your affliction. And Hagar responded to God's graciousness by giving him the name, a new name, the God who sees. To the outcast on her knees, you were the God who truly sees. Right. Of course, later on, Sarah becomes pregnant and gives birth to Isaac. So God is the God who sees and creates a great nation out of both women, taking care of Sarah's big concern. God didn't need help. He delivered on his promise. Taking things out of God's hand was terrible for the relationship. Now, sometimes stupidity doesn't fix so easily. If Sarah was the author of the harebrained so-called solution in the first example, Abraham, who should have seen the problems inherent to the surrogate wife a mile away, comes up with a Fred Flintstone idea of his own. When they move south and enter the land of Gerar, listen as I read Genesis 20, 1 to 15. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the region of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. And while residing in Gerar as an alien, Abraham said of his wife, Sarah, she's my sister. And King Abimelech of Gerar sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, You are about to die because of the woman you have taken. For she's a married woman. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, She is my sister? And she herself said, He is my brother? I did this in the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hand. Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. Furthermore, it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all that are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things, and the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I sinned against you that you have brought such great guilt on me and my kingdom? You have done things to me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What were you thinking of that you did this thing? And Abraham said, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God in all this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, This is the kindness you must do to me. At every place to which we come, say of me, he is my brother. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen, male and female slaves, gave them to Abraham, and restored his wife Sarah to him. And Abimelech says, My land is before you. Settle wherever it pleases you. Now we come to the second triangle. We understand that Abraham is literally in unfamiliar territory. And beyond his own company, as far as he can see, all the people around him are against him. He can't rely on Bruce for, brute force. He's outnumbered. So because God has told Abraham that he is essential to God's plan for the future, Abraham thought God needed help protecting him, protecting Abraham's life. So he comes up with the idea to call Sarah his sister instead of his wife. Again, what was he thinking? I know he equivocates later on that after all, she really was his half-sister. Uh, the, ma the marriage predates his faith in God. We just got to let that one go. But how demeaning to her. In these two situations, 
Abraham and Sarah take turns agreeing with each other's really dumb plan. If they learn that you're my wife, Sarah, they'll kill me to get you. Now, do you see the similarities between the two triangles? In both cases, Abraham and Sarah figure that God needs help doing his job. Needs help keeping his promises. They don't grasp the greatness of God. Nothing is too too difficult for him. When you try to do in your relationships those things that ought to be left for God to do, you mess up your relationships. What God did to remedy the situation is remarkable. He told King Abimelech the truth about what was going on, prevented him from sin, and then protected and provided for Abraham. Did you hear that part? Far more than Abraham had thought possible. Now, Again, just because Abraham is on a journey with God doesn't mean he wasn't going to make bad choices, especially when he stopped listening. But God stayed with him and worked for good. You see, when we walk with the Lord, he won't let us sink beyond repair. He works with us, shapes us through the journey. Each time, each triangle, God provided for those who were weak. Now, because the culture around us no longer embraces many Christian virtues, I have to answer objections that you might have yourself or that those you seek to influence toward Jesus might have. You know, many people who consider themselves thoroughly modern would look at our second reading and ask, well, what's the big deal about keeping Abimelech from Sarah? Well, Abimelech is a typical Middle Eastern king at the time. He's complete with an army of wives and concubines. Apparently, Sarah is brought into the harem, but has not been brought into Abimelech yet. He hasn't touched her. And the so-called modern mind says, well, it's only sex. At a recent seminar, author Rebecca McLaughlin commented that the only hope that many men and women in their 20s and 30s today have of ever finding the life partner that they still really want to have, is to sleep with lots of people and hope that one of those relationships grows into something. Absolutely cart before the horse. But that's the depressing situation that's out there. In reality, it makes lasting happiness almost impossible to find. And this is the legacy of the so-called sexual revolution that those of us who are baby boomers have left to those who come after us. We try to not call it sin, but that doesn't change what it does. It doesn't change God's opinion. God hates sin because sin hurts people. He's not trying to spoil our fun. He is love and his ways lead to the abundant life. And really, Abraham, I have to ask again, what were you thinking? No way would Abimelech getting together with Sarah ever be a good idea. Jealousy, mixed loyalties, disappointment, on and on. The Christian sexual morality of waiting for and then keeping to a mutually loving and encouraging marriage is not popular. But that which is offered as a replacement leaves wounded people strewn everywhere. And many children fight an uphill battle their whole lives long are part of that wake. We're here to help, but avoiding problems at the start should at least be considered, it seems to me. If Abraham and Sarah got into trouble because their vision of God was too small, then the corollary is also true. Trusting God to be big enough to face our situations leads to strong relationships. Trust him together. Some people think you've got to chuck the Christian morals if you're going to get rich. They're perfectly happy to serve mammon, what material goods were called in Jesus' day. But as Charles Dickens described so eloquently in The Christmas Carol, 
Scrooge ends up all alone because he chose to serve mammon rather than focus on true wealth. Pursuing mammon pr delayed and destroyed his relationships. You know, you might become what the world calls rich or you might not. But to those who trust in Jesus, we have this assurance. Philippians 4.19, my God will supply every one of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Don't idolize money. Trust God to be big enough. Money, we also have to trust God. We choose to trust him and not trust in sexual pleasure. Uh, Dallas Willard wrote, we are so hungry for love in this age, we keep hammering the sex button and hope that a little intimacy will dribble out. So don't confuse intimacy with sex. Trust God to be big enough to lead you in your relationships. Stacy Padula, at a recent relevant service, reminded us of Psalm 84 that says, God withholds no good thing from those who walk uprightly. No good thing. He puts the lonely in families, he says. The false trinity of our age is to worship money, sex, and power. And we've dealt with the first two. The final idol to be toppled is power. It's very common to speak of a lust for power. Corporate and government offices around the world are filled with unhappy people craving power. They're driven in a nonstop pursuit of what they call greatness. I'm going to be somebody. What good is it, though, to be the great man on the Titanic? get that sinking feeling? Sorry. <laughs> Do you want to gain the whole world and then lose your soul? If we aren't on the big boss's good side, what good is it? Jesus said, whoever would be great in the kingdom of God must learn to be the servant of all. And greatness in God's kingdom comes through service. You know, one of the things I love about a pulpit ministry is the spiritual exercise of preparing the Sunday message. Not everyone realizes that the pastor hears the sermon first. And like you, some hit me more than others. And four years ago, I preached about the, way, the powerful way God uses friendships that are submitted to him. And I talked to you about Olympic champion Jesse Owens and his unlikely friendship with the German champion, Lutz Long. It was four years ago. That means it's on the other side of COVID, so I assume most of you haven't remembered. <laughs> but they met during the long jump in full view of 50,000 people, the African-American and the German promoted by Hitler as the ideal Aryan. But that was Hitler's spin. It was not Lutz Long's heart. Long watched as crooked German judges called fouls on Jesse's first two jumps in the qualifying round. He had only one more chance to qualify. And Jesse felt all alone. He was acutely aware of the Nazi desire to prove Aryan superiority, especially over blacks. So quietly, he asked God for help. And at this point, the tall German walks over and introduces himself and says, you should be able to qualify with your eyes closed, referring to Owen's first two jumps. For the next few minutes, the black son of a sharecropper and the white so-called model of Nazi manhood chatted. And then Long made a suggestion. Jo Jesse owned the world record with a jump of over 26 feet. The qualifying distance was only 23 feet, five and a half inches. So Louis Long says, why not make a mark like six inches before the board? Just to play it safe. Owens did qualify it easily. In the final, Owens set an Olympic record and earned the second of his four gold medals, 
from those 1936 Berlin Olympics. And the first person to congratulate him was Lutz Long, in full view of Adolf Hitler. God made friends whom the world wanted to call enemies. They never saw each other again, but they wrote. Owens was a committed, a committed Christian, long doubted. Their correspondence covered many topics. And as war approached, Lutz Long, a practicing attorney, was, had a rifle shoved in his hand and was pointed to go join the army as a soldier, simple soldier. He was stationed in North Africa with the German army, later killed in action. His last letter reached Jesse Owens a year after it was sent. And this is what it says. I am here, Jesse, where it seems there is only the dry sand and the wet blood. I do not fear so much for myself, my friend Jesse. I fear for my wife, who is home, and my young son, Carl, who has never really known his father. My heart tells me, if I be honest with you, that this is the last letter I shall ever write. If it is so, I ask you to do something very important for me. It is, you go to Germany when this war is done. Someday, find my Carl, his son. Tell him about his father. Tell him, Jesse, what times were like when we were not separated by war. I am saying, tell him how things can be between men on this earth. If you do this something for me, this thing that I need the most to know will be done, I do something for you now. I tell you something I know you want to hear and it is true. That hour in Berlin when I first spoke to you, when you had your knee upon the ground, I knew that you were in prayer. I did not know then how I knew. Uh, now I do. I know it is never by chance that we came together. I came to you that hour in 1936 for a purpose more than Der Berliner Olympiade. And you, I believe, will read this letter, while it should not be possible to reach you ever, for a purpose more than even our friendship. A little bit of broken English. I believe that this shall come about because I think now that God will make it come about. This is what I have to tell you, Jesse. I think I might believe in God. And I pray to him that even while it should not be possible for this to reach you ever, these words I write will still be read for you, by you. Years later, as per Long's request, Owens met and became firm friends with his son Carl. He also went on to serve as best man at Carl's wedding. And he later wrote, you could melt down all the gold medals and cups that I have, and they wouldn't be a plating on the 24 karat friendship I had with Lutz Long. Relationships are where God shapes us. Abraham learned for himself that we get into our trouble when, in our relationships when our vision of God is too small. As much as you can, try not to learn this lesson the hard way. Instead, trust God, trust his ways. Do not get fooled into believing that his ways need updating. Keep your eyes on him. He will lead you in the path everlasting. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you that you understand what relationships mean to us. That you don't have us live out our life just only vertical. But the horizontal, the, the connecting to the people around us is part of your plan. How good it is to have a savior who walked among us, who loved friends, a family who understands us. We give you our relationships, particularly the difficult ones. 
would you help us know how to be true to you in each of those? Please help us from, uh, d deliver us from thinking that your ways need improvement and that we could help you out in that department. And Lord, when we do stumble, help us to get right back in touch with you in right relationship and would you rescue. Help us humbly to be part of your purposes in the lives of these you give us to love. In our families, in our churches, each situation. And may you so shape us that your light shines in and through us and especially through the relationships that we make you Lord of. We ask it in Jesus' name. So we sing and pray, teach me thy way, O Lord. us, be our rear guard, and help us in each of our relationships to shine with a light that gives praise to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week.